Hello, everybody, and welcome to uh, Winning the Writing Game, live today from the UK, the Republic of Ireland, and Canada. Welcome also to our viewers from all over the world, from uh, Italy, South America, Nova Scotia, and closer to home. Uh, it feels like a fitting international coming together today for our one-hour insight into the creative mind of one of the world's biggest selling thriller writers, the amazing Linwood Barclay, whose new book, Find You First, we are here to help celebrate today. I'll be handing over in a moment to uh, my best-selling colleague, Sam Blake, uh, who's going to quiz Linwood. And remember that we welcome your comments and questions live throughout the next hour. I'll pop back at the end to join in and uh, pose some of them on your behalf. Um, before we start, I would highly recommend two things. Firstly, order Linwood's new book, Find You First, now via your local independent bookstore. We need to support them at this point in time. And secondly, do register for updates on Linwood's excellent website, linwoodbarclay.com. Firstly, uh, a little bit of scene setting. Um, Linwood is, of course, a New York Times bestselling author with over 20 novels to his credit. He spent three decades in newspapers before turning full-time to writing thrillers. His books have been translated into a breathtaking 30 languages, sold millions of copies, and he counts a certain Mr. Stephen King among his fans. Many of his books, as you imagine, have been optioned for film and TV, and um, there was a series made in France, and Linwood wrote the screenplay for the film based on his novel, Never Saw It Coming. Born in the USA, uh, Linwood's parents moved to Canada just as he was turning four, and he's lived there ever since. So after launching his debut, uh, the Zach Walker series in 2004, his first standalone thriller, No Time for Goodbye, crashed onto the international thriller scene. Over here, it spent seven straight weeks at number one and was the UK's best-selling novel of the year. So success after success has followed. And uh, of his newest book, one reviewer said, it's the best book of his career. I couldn't put it down and you won't be able to either. If you enjoy thrillers, this is the real deal. It never lets up. That reviewer was Stephen King. Praise indeed. So Linwood, you are very welcome indeed to How to Win the Writing Game and uh, Sam Blake. It's over to you now to get all forensic. Hi there, Simon. Thank you so much. I'm just bringing Linwood in now. And we can, uh, there he is. Hi, Mr. Barkley. How are you doing there in Canada? Good morning. Hi, how are you? Good morning. But uh, as we progress, we're going to start to get some sunshine in the window, I think. Hi, how Indeed. are you? Good, very early start. I'm going to pop Simon out of the stream and then we will be, there we go, have a bit more space to chat. He'll be back a bit later. Um, we're, we're thrilled you're able to join us and I have been completely gripped by Find You First. Um, let me show it to everybody there on the screen. That's the main cover, isn't it? Um, I've got it. I'm going to bang it out into the comments soon, the buy link as well. Um, but let me take you back just to the start of your career. Um, our audience is very much aspiring writers and people who basically just want to find out what it is that sells a million books. So that's all we need to get through. That's basically the bottom line today is to find out how how do you do it. <laughs> so let's just go right back to, I suppose, starting out. And we were talking earlier before we came on about The Man from Uncle and how that inspired you to start writing or coming up with stories age 12. So just take us back and give us a little bit of background um, of your how you got there. Yeah, I like to, I'm, I'm sort of, um, as people, you know, if people are looking for advice, I'm kind of a overnight success after 40 years or so. So, um, but I mean, I was, <clears throat> I, I was very interested in writing from a very early age, and I, and I do credit television in many ways. I mean, people, when people say, what inspired you? And I want to be able to say, well, it was Hemingway, it was Shakespeare, you know, it was, it was television. And I was a kid of the 60s, and I had my favorite shows like, uh, the Man from Uncle and Mission Impossible and Mannix and all this kind of stuff, and and around the age of ten, eleven, I was finding that an episode a week of the show was not enough for me. I needed I needed more adventures of these characters. So I thought, well, I'll just write them myself. What we would call fan fiction today, and so 
I think I was around 11 when I asked my dad to teach me how to type on this old uh, Royal typewriter we had that wow. weighed about the same as a Volkswagen. And, and so I started writing, you know, by the time I was 12, I was writing 30, 40 page double space type novellas, mostly, wow. based on, mostly based on the man from uncle, but on others. And so, and, uh, and so, uh, it was, it was those kind of shows that got me interested in writing because I just had to have more adventures from of these people. And so that's what kind of got me going. And I would say probably when I was 14, 15, 16, 17 years old, I thought what I really want to do more than anything is to write for television. But, you know, there's not a lot of demand for 17 year old TV script writers. And so I just, and I was writing short stories and I was writing other things. And, and I guess around the time I got, was getting, getting to university, I was writing uh, novels that were, you know, with characters that I had invented instead of yeah. someone. And so probably by, probably by the time I was 20, 22, 23, 24 in there, I think I wrote at least three full novels, um, none of which were published, uh, thankfully. Uh, <laughs> I sent them out. I just sent them all. You know, I, I had been, I had, was in my early 20s. I was rejected by some of the biggest and most prestigious publishers that are out. <laughs> That's a true accolade. I like to joke, you know, I could, I could get a send a manuscript, put it in the mail, and send it off to Simon and Schuster, and it would be home by the time I got there. Like, that's the best they could reject. <laughs> and yet, I had some, <clears throat> I had some wonderful encouragement from some very established authors, a couple of them too, that I got to know. Um, a Canadian writer named uh, Margaret Lawrence and the uh, Ross MacDonald, the author who created the Lou Archer novels and so forth, who I incredibly had a, had a friendship with and, and had dinner with one night when I was 21 years old. But um, it wasn't to be at that time. So when I was 22, I thought, well, where can a guy get paid money to write every day? And I got a newspaper job and I spent three decades in newspapers. And the last half of it, I was a columnist. I got a gig as a columnist at the Toronto Star where I had already worked for 12 years as an editor. I mean, lots of the, the departments. And, um, and so it was, I got the column in 1993. And, uh, and out of the column grew, I did do actually four books that preceded any of my crime novels that were all Canada, three sort of straight humor books and a memoir. And um, so that kind of got me back up and running to do what I'd always wanted to do. And around 2001, I had an idea for a novel and developed it and got an agent and that got published by Bantam in the US. That's and fantastic. That was a character named Zach Walker. I did four books about him that were only published in North America and sold collectively like 28 copies and uh, <laughs> then I shifted gears and wrote this book that was just mentioned no time for goodbye and that's the yeah. book that and that's the one that did it what's really interesting listening to that two things strike me first of all in writing fan fiction and writing so many words and creating your novels and <clears throat> doing English in university you begin to understand story structure I think I think even if you don't even know you're doing it but that that story structure that comes particularly from TV and the arcs that you need within each show is something that you you must have been taking on board um and the other thing that strikes me is Malcolm Gladwell talks about um 10,000 hours needing to be the the, the reach you know you need to do 10,000 hours of whatever it is to reach the tipping point for success and you must have had hundreds of thousands of words under your belt by the time you wrote like no time for goodbye Oh, that's true. I mean, I had, I mean, I did, by the time I did No Time for Goodbye, I had, like I said, I'd done a couple of humor books. I wrote a memoir. I had done four novels about Zach. So, I mean, we already had, and of course, all the columns that I wrote. Yeah. So I, I had, uh, I probably had well over a million words under my, under my Lots belt. Lots of practice, <laughs> definitely. Because, well, I mean, you do three columns a week. <clears throat> I worked out that that was 60,000 words roughly a year that I wrote for the newspaper. Which is a book in itself, yeah. And so 
so yeah, by the time I came to actually doing No Time for Kill, I had written probably a million and a half words or so. Got that seriously got the hang of it. I think that's what's really interesting is that it's the first of like you're at book twenty now, all standalones. And um, the thing I love about No Time for Goodbye, and I'm really interested in, is that inversion of story idea, um, because it was based on a true thing, wasn't it? Where the, the little girl, there was a true story in, in Canada that you based it on, but you ch changed it around. So just talk to us a little bit about that, and then we'll get yeah. on to find you, find you first. People are always wondering where, you know, where did the, the ideas come from? And as among, as you would know, I mean, among the writing community, that's sort of our, our sort of hilarious cliche question is where do you get your ideas? Mm -hmm. Which, but I understand that question, you know, I mean, it's easier for us to laugh, but, it's easy, but I understand it because, you know, we could sit here and think, where did, where did Mac Lennon and McCartney get all those songs? Like, where yeah. did those come from? Yeah. Like, I'm as baffled by that as anybody would be about where we get our ideas to write book. And so sometimes ideas just come out of thin air. They're just there. And sometimes they're inspired by something. And sometimes an idea that inspires you is not the idea you end up with, but it triggers an idea. So yeah. No Time for Goodbye was a, a thriller about a 14-year-old girl who wakes up one morning and her whole family is gone. Like her mother's gone, her brother, her dad, they're all gone. And they just appeared in the night. And what actually inspired that was a, a, a story in the Toronto area of a 14 year old girl who had been abducted from her house in the night. And when her parents woke up in the morning, she was gone. She was gone. Yeah. And I was just thinking about that. I thought, what if you turned that upside down? <sighs> That's the really interesting bit to me is the fact that you take the idea and then you flip it. And so, so that, so that became a novel, not about what had happened, but what had happened had just triggered a thought. And then I thought, how do you take that idea and twist it into something else? And so that's that's where that book came from. And and a lot of times stories can be like that. You get an idea or something strikes you. I mean, I did a book, I seen somebody somewhere along the side there, there's some questions from people, and I yeah. saw an elevator pitch, which yeah. is the four find you first. I'm and just gonna bang this, so I'm just gonna interrupt you. Bang no time for goodbye into the stream so people can see the cover. A link, a link there to buy. Oh look. Proof of loving man from uncle. This is one of my, my <laughs> on the mug. There we go. Uh, Let me get rid of that. And then we'll go on to elevator pitch. So we take elevator pitch as an example. Um, Toronto is uh, the downtown of the, by the waterfront of Toronto where I live was in the last 10 years now looks more like Hong Kong. There are just literally dozens of massively tall condo towers. Mm -hmm. And there was a story on the news locally one day that the city did not have um, enough elevator inspectors to keep up with this rate of construction. There had not been any problems, but it was just simply, we just need more people. And I heard that, and just hearing that, I instantly had this, what if you had a guy who was a, a sort of a very different kind of serial killer who was taking people out of the picture by sabotaging elevators across Manhattan? Just, that's, his, uh, that's what he does. So there had been no news story about someone doing that. There had been no news story about an elevator accident. But I heard that item on the news and it just the idea was just there. Yeah. And I think that's what sometimes make those of us who are writers and those who are not, writers take an innocent situation and think about how horribly wrong that it could go. <laughs> yes. And so that was one of those, those circumstances. Oh, it's fascinating. I, I find it fascinating. It's that it's just yeah, the way your mind works, and you, you're so right about that Lennon McCartney thing because yeah, everybody asks about where these ideas come from, um, and it's a bit unpredictable, isn't it? So, Find yeah. You First is the current book about tech millionaires, yeah. various various people with lots of money, and all sorts of old things that happen. Um, where did that idea come from? Well, before I tell you the idea, I guess I should tell you just briefly what it's it's about, and it's uh, it's about a very wealthy tech guy who's in his 40s, has no wife, he doesn't have family, he's just on his own. And uh, he learns that, you know, the one thing money can't buy is time. And he has learned that he has a terminal illness. And the doctor says, well, it's just as well you never had kids because this, this is a disease that passes on to about 50% of offspring. And what our character Miles knows, and the doctor does not, is that years ago he was a sperm donor. So there can be any number of kids out there, grown adults, 
who might come down with this. Plus, he has all this millions of dollars. Like, what's he going to do with it? So after a lot of soul searching, he thinks, you know, I'm going to find these kids who are I'm the father of. And first of all, let them know that, that they might want to get themselves checked. They might have this condition. And also, I'm just who I'm going to leave my money to. And as he embarks on the search, uh, all of these potential heirs start vanishing one by one. They just start, they're not just getting killed, like they just vanish. Yeah. And, um, and every trace of them does. And that's, that's our jumping off point. And, and the first of these, you know, potential heirs that he does find before anyone gets to yeah. him is Chloe, who's an aspiring documentarian. And so Chloe and Miles are trying to figure out what the hell's going on with all these others disappearing. And the sort of slight inspiration for this was a piece, I think a couple of years ago in the New York Times uh, magazine, uh, it was kind of a photo essay of, uh, of uh, someone who was going across the country taking pictures of half siblings who'd all, yeah. these, who'd all come from the same sperm donor. And it was kind of an interesting sort of celebration, an interesting exploration of that idea. And as I, like I mentioned before, as a thriller writer, I looked at that and thought, how could that? <laughs> and, so, so that was the, the jumping off point. Um, and I, and this is often the case with, with writing a thriller. I had the idea, I had the hook, which is they're all disappearing, but I had no idea why. Yeah. It's kind of like when I, when I wrote No Time for Goodbye, when I had the initial idea for No Time for Goodbye and this girl wakes up and the family's gone. And I talked to my agent that morning, at, my literary agent. She said, that is a great, pitch for you know opening for a thriller a great hook and because she's very good with plot and so forth and we talk these things out she said what happened to the family and i said i have no idea <laughs> and she said well you'll figure that out and we did and so find you first is a book like that i mean it's i had my setup i had my hook yeah these, they're all these were all vanishing but i but i didn't know why i had i had one idea of why i thought it was but the more I thought about it, the more I, could, I didn't. It didn't. I couldn't make it work the way I wanted it to, and so then I brought in basically an entire parallel story into the novel, and yeah. that that was my solution. It's fascinating. That brings me on to structure. But I, I love. We open with Todd and Chloe has found. I find it really fascinating how you draw in sort of um, modern day influences and things that resonate with people. So there's a DNA database that you mentioned. Chloe's discovered her, she's using one of these, um, I've forgotten the name of the all of them now, um, you know, the DNA database where you can go and get find your relatives or whatever they're called. And um, she hooks up with Todd, doesn't she? So this is where we with where the book starts. And um, that's fascinating because you're because that's starting to come through and people finding relatives and there are sort of stories that are coming through the news um and there's yeah lots of other things there's sort of an epstein type thread isn't there as well um and so you're drawing on a lot of things that really resonate with people i think um which makes the story feel really real um and the other thing that you have managed you do in, in all your books is really create amazing characters so chloe just like you say, she's a documentarian. She works in a diner. She's got this park racer car, and she's just so real. I mean, did you spend a long time researching her and getting into, her, or did she just arrive in your head? She just came. She just showed up at the door, and there she was. You know, <clears throat> and, she's so strong. And I just kind of had an, in, an instant sense of Chloe, that she was a very strong-willed, independent-minded young woman with a, with a talent for for photography and interviewing and so forth and she was just there all at once and her sort of smart alecky nature and and she becomes a great kind of foil for miles yeah. too you know miles is this big wealthy tech guy who thinks he's just you know so it's such a bright guy and she just kind of cuts him off at the knees all the time like you think you know everything but do you really know this and and so but you know i'd love to tell you that i spent a lot of time researching her and thinking about her for days but i didn't she was just there i think that's the gift though as a writer that that happens sometimes doesn't it the characters literally just survive joseph o'connor i keep quoting this but joseph o'connor has this um an irish writer has this uh, theory that cat that uh, the characters sort of float around our heads as writers in some sort of ether and they they're waiting to connect with the writers who are going to tell their story um and when they arrive then quite often they arrive fully formed and that's what it sounds like i feel that way kind of about this, this whole sort of 
the story in its in its essence. You know, like yeah. the very idea for the story, like a girl wakes up, nobody's home, or this guy's trying to. Like, this I always feel like those are the ideas that are just sort of floating out there, and they're just and, and, and looking to land on the right person. And uh, these little radar things on our head, and we're just waiting. <laughs> They go by and i exactly. still one of them a year i'll be fine yeah you know, absolutely one, other ones just floated right past just now and i thought i wish i'd grab that one but anyway. <laughs> that's exactly it and the, the structure of this is quite complicated because you've got the parallel stories you've got nine children that miles needs to find um who are all disappearing and then you've got your parallel story as well and there's so that you've got quite a lot of characters going on you've got fantastic character. I love Sharice as well I have to say the dry Miles' driver she's just yeah. awesome I can feel these people they they make either great tv or another another book series characters they're just I'd love to know more about them um so you've got fantastic set of characters but it's complicated there's lots of people there's lots of story and it's really woven in tightly so did you structure that quite did, or did you just sit down and write it out I mean how did you how did you tackle I it sat down and wrote it out I mean it's I, not just in this book, but in a lot of my other ones, I find that if you have, say you've got several storylines going, you've mm -hmm. got say, four sort of storylines, you've got A, B, C, and D, and I just kind of, you kind of rotate them. You do, you do your A story and then end that chapter on a bit of a cliffhanger, but then you go to your B story yeah. and you're thinking as a reader, you think, well, I want to get back to the A story because there's something big happened. But now we're in the B story, and the B story ends with a kind of a cliffhanger. And you're like, now I got two I got to get back to. But then we go to the C story, and you're kind of rotating them around so that you're always falling into another story, but racing through it to get back to the other thread. And so it's it's kind of like this revolving door of stuff going on. And so I think that helps propel the story. Yeah. In my earlier novels, I tended to tell the entire book from a first person point of view. So we were only ever with the main character and the story is very kind of linear but when you start having more than one point of view you can kind of dip in here and come back over here and i think i think that when at least for me that um you can you can build suspense too i think if you jump to a storyline that our main character is unaware of but you know about it as the writer and as the reader you know about it and so you're thinking I know some shit that the main character doesn't know, and I wish there was a way I could tell him because he's going to be in a whole lot of trouble. And he has to know about it, but you do. And I think that's kind of where the suspense goes off. It's, I think Hitchcock talked about this one time. He said, if you're all sitting around, if the characters are all sitting around and a bomb goes off, that's shocking. But if the characters are all sitting around and there's a bag that has a bomb in it and you know it, and you're waiting for it to go off or waiting for them to know that it's going to go off. That's what builds the suspense. Absolutely. I think that that's like pure goals for people watching for to understand that structure. Um, and although, yeah, you don't, you see, you don't plot it out. All of those years of writing fan fiction and understanding story structure, are what goes into it. So it becomes instinctive, I think. Yeah. And I, and I think for me, like, like I say, because TV was such an immense influence on me, I always feel that chapter breaks are commercial breaks. You know, okay. like whenever you watch a show as a kid, you know, you came up to a certain point and then all of a sudden our hero fell down a well or something and then we went to a commercial. And so it's like, I got to go to the bathroom and get a sandwich and I'll be right back. And so you come back and think what happened? So I always feel like chapter breaks are those commercial breaks that you end in such a way that you feel you have to continue. Because I'll sometimes read other authors and they'll give me a, a very dramatic turning point and it comes in the middle of a chapter and I think, don't do it there. Do it at the end. Because I think there's also something, there's something kind of, I mean, I'm trying to find an example. I'm just called, okay, so this is called a book. And so I think that this, what you see over here, is, is a kind of graphic suspense space or something. Like when you see that, that tells you we're taking a break because something big has happened or something big is about to happen or we've just yeah. had a and so that's, and then, and then there's this big chunk of white space that hammers that point home to you. And, and uh, that's, that, that white space is the commercial break. And so that's the way I think about trying to end, trying, not always successful, but trying to end chapters in such a way that you think, oh, that's what the, I gotta, I gotta keep on going. Yeah, I got to keep. I'm loving this. I, I always say to people that I learn something every single time I speak to an author. And that way of looking at chapters is 
honestly genius it's great it's that's exactly what it is isn't it it's that you have to as, as an author you have to it would be lovely if we thought that people just read our books right the way through but you know people do have to sleep occasionally but if we think about it in terms of being a commercial break then yeah you want to go back so that's i think that's yeah that and that is literally the way this book works because you can't put it down you need to know what's going to happen next because of that suspension that 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 whole the fact that you know bits and you know and you want to know what's happening and how's it going to play out and what's going to happen and it's really clever it has it's the highest octane book i've read in a long time and the ending is just insanely brilliant <laughs> so you guys have to get uh, make sure you buy your copy i'm going to pop it in yeah. the screen now just i'm going to do up there so you can say that just in case and um it's it has it so he keeps up the momentum all the way through and i can see completely from what you're saying that that structure is what is what is prope propelling it um, yeah, and it's, it's sort of a cliche, but I think that, um, you know, especially once you kind of hit to the midpoint of a book, that the book is this big boulder rolling down a hill. Yeah. And it's it's just going to go faster and faster as it heads down that hill. And, and I think this, I do think this book worked that way. And it does have a kind of over the top, outrageous kind of, you know, action towards the end, which I couldn't wait to get to. Crazy, uh, but it's fun. <laughs> it's so good. <laughs> really is yeah and it explains something it's foreshadowed brilliantly because something happens right at the beginning and you're thinking how mad is this and then it all it comes into play all the way through so yeah i'm not going to give them any spoilers they have to they have to read it to find out what it's all about um no really really excellent um so we've got that's character sometimes they arrive and the structure um you did uh, i think a master class once i'll just pop out the cover so i can see you properly there we go you did a master class once where you were speaking about um how important the first page was in a book mm. Is the first page that you write the first page that we read, or does it sometimes take a, a while to play around and move stuff about? That varies. Um, you know, sometimes I'll write something and then I decide to tack a prologue on at the beginning. Um, but by this point, generally, the first page that I do is ends up staying that way. Um, but I do say, I mean, a lot of times people will ask, you know, it, 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 at a writing seminar, people are asking about how to get published and and my experience for what it's worth is you know if you're looking for an agent and i think trying to find a literary agent is a really good way to go if you can if you can get one to to, to and and contrary to what you might think you know i mean literary agents but but may get you know, 20 30 submissions a day but a lot of them will look at all of them like they'll have a quick look it sometimes take long you know i mean if you if you if you're a literary agent and the first email of the day is I've written a collection of poetry about camels. You might think, delete. That's the read <laughs> That's not me. You know, like, you know, maybe one poem about a camel would be great, but I don't need a whole book of them. So you can go through these things and think, yeah, that's that. But then you might call up something and, and it looks kind of interesting. But you've still got 30 other emails to get to. So you think, well, I'm going to have a look at this. I'll look at the page. I'll look at first the first page. And I always feel like you'll you'll live or die based on the first page, because um, a first page will give a, a, an agent or a reader a sense of of tone and voice, and whether you can write. You can't get the story out in page one. You can't get all that. You know, you can't get a sense of what it's about, but you can get a sense of what this how this person writes, and. Which is why, I mean, the, the most the brilliant American writer no longer with us, Elmore Leonard, you know, there's a reason why he said, never start with weather. Yeah, absolutely. Or, you know, the sun was shining and I was like, I'm already, <clears throat> like, I'm out. <laughs> so if you have, I think like you really have to find a way to get a, a reader's attention really quickly, especially now, more than ever, I feel, because I feel like, you know, I'm, I'm binge watching this show and that show and we're trying to get through the pandemic watching you know every night watch tonight and we can consume television now the way we used to consume we would consume a book yeah. chapter after chapter we don't have to wait a week like i did when i was a kid mm. so I, novelists that's our competition yeah we're going to grab hold of you long enough so that you won't watch you know Ten stick all of the crown or the queen's gambit. Like, what can we do to get your attention so that yeah. you? So we don't have a lot of time to grab you. So that's why I think that you really have to to engage the reader in a hurry. And I think agents are looking for that. It was funny when I when I was writing my first of my four sort of comic thrillers about Zach Walker. 
I had, a, I called up an agent and I, and, and she, I said, I wanted to send her something. And she said, well, what is it? I said, it's a comic thriller. And she said, oh, <laughs> she, <laughs> said, she said, those are very hard to do. Very few people do them well. Very few comic thrillers are, are you know, bestsellers. But she said, if you want to send me the first chapter, can. So I emailed her the first chapter. And the next day she emailed me back and she said, email me chapter two. Ooh, good sign. So, so she gave that first chapter enough time to just sort of look. Okay. And, and, it, and, it, and it worked. But I'm just, but, you know, hammering the point home, I think that you, you don't have much time to get people's attention. No, you're dead right. And I think that's, that's again, gold dust advice. Um, and in Find, Find You First, it's Todd we meet first. And yeah. we, and it's really interesting because actually all your characters have lives, complete lives of their own, as well as being part of the book. Um, so Todd is busy doing his uh, few nefarious things um, that involve mobile phones and conning people out of money um, as well. So we, at, when we arrive into his trailer, um, we we find a whole lot about his life. We get a real sense of your writing and we're completely hooked because we want to know what's going on. We want to know what's going on in his life and we want to know what's going on and how it all pans out. Um, so I think that's, yeah, absolutely gold dust advice and massively well achieved in this because it does literally hook you straight in. And something about that first chapter. Now, the first chapter of Find Your First is kind of takes place two weeks later into the story. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's a prologue. And then after this, uh, this little story about Todd, we go back to whatever it is a month earlier, two weeks ago. I forget. I wrote it so long ago. Yeah, and, anyway, I know. That's the problem, isn't it? You're writing the next one now. <laughs> the thing is, if I, were, if I were to tell this story in a, completely in a linear way, then I would start off where chapter one starts. Now we would go a very long time before we had a major event of a, a serious crime. And so I think there has to be a way to get your attention, as we were just saying, right away. So I bring one of those crimes that's in the future and I give it to you in chapter right in the beginning. Here's a big thing that happened. And then we're going to find out later what led to that moment. Exactly. And Something I kind of, I don't know if you know, um, this uh, uh, American TV producer, TV creator, you know, genius guy, J.J. Abrams, who's now doing Star Wars movies and all that kind of stuff. And I got on to J.J. Abrams watching stuff of his way back when I when he was doing the show called Alias. And if you look at Alias, or if you look at the third Mission Impossible movie, which J.J. Abrams did, and so forth you see a trick that he does all the time, which is he he starts with a hugely dramatic moment, very tense, very suspenseful, and it's like, it hits you right in the face, right from the beginning. And then it's like, holy mackerel. And then it ends, and then we go to two days earlier, three days earlier, whatever it was. And you think, okay, we know something, we know that something huge is coming because we've had a teaser of it. Yeah. And so now we're willing to just sit down here for a little while and be patient. And find out because that's the thing you need to read because you need to find out how this thing happened and why it happened and it, and it literally it propels you through. Now it, I think we, it's it's fascinating to hear that how much I mean we know we can learn lots of screenwriting and lots of, but it's it's fascinating to hear how you approach the story um, because we I think we learn so much just from listening to different people's ways in and all the information you've gleaned through your writing career and obviously uh, watching lots of um, TV and drawing on those threads um, is what makes a book work and what makes a book so successful. Um, what I find fascinating as well is the fact you're on book 20 and there's 20 standalones and it's a new idea and fresh characters every time. Does it take you a long time? I think you write your first drafts quite quickly, so I'm going to ask you about that in a minute, but does it take you a long time to think about the idea and get that bit working? Yeah, in fact, and in fact, there's, there's, they're kind of a mix. They're mostly standalones. The first four novels were part of a series about Zach Walker. So I had yeah, those four. Those, yeah. And then I stopped, then I started doing standalones. And then I did, I don't know, about five years ago or six years ago, I had, I, I did a trilogy of sort of three linked novels. I wouldn't call it a series. It's kind of like, it was kind of like one really huge standalone. Of yeah. Three Broken Promise, Far From True, and the 23. And then I did do one more book with those characters in Parting Shot. You take those aside, and you're quite right. I've done standalones, and and um, the, the the there's advantage and disadvantage to both. I mean, if you're writing a series, I think sort of half your work's done for you. You have yeah. your character, 
got your setting, you've got all this stuff. You think, just what will I do with them this time? And yet, with um, with a standalone, you're starting from scratch because you have to. You've got everything to create. Um, but uh, you know, the thing is, with a standalone, you can do anything you want with these people. Yeah. Because you know, you don't have to save any of them for another book. Yeah. Where that's true. Limited in in a in a, a series. I mean, if you're reading one of the new James Bonds, whether it's way back when, when Ian Fleming was doing it, or whether it's Anthony Horowitz's take on him, which are very, very good, um, you know he'll be okay. Yeah. You know James Bond. That'll be tense, it'll be interesting, but like when you read, when you read a, a Lee Child's Jack Reacher, which are great books, I'm always much more worried for the people Reacher meets. Oh, now, definitely. Self. <laughs> yeah. Reacher will be fine, but all these other people are going to have the shit beat out of them. Yeah, you know? yeah. So, but in a but in a standalone, you don't know for sure. I mean, yeah. I did a couple years ago called "A Noise Downstairs." Mm-hmm. I think it was a standalone, and it allowed me to do something that you often can't do, which I won't get into. But I mean, it's you know, you can you can do anything you want to these people. Yeah, it's fantastic. And so, do, does that does that process of, of sort of finding the story and thinking about it? Do you spend a long time thinking about? Um, how the story is going to evolve, or do you literally start off with that spark of idea and start writing and see where it's going to take you? No, that's the one. That's the one time where I kind of have to slow down or stop. I mean, I have to. Um, when I before I started uh, writing, find you first. Mm-hmm. I I knew that all these people were vanishing, but I didn't know why. So I had to know that before I started. I yeah. had. To, I really needed to know that. So you know, they talk about right, you know that sort of cliche phrase of writers, are you a plotter or a pantser? Do you yeah. plot or go by the seat of your pants? I'm sort of in the middle. In between. You know, I know the big picture. Yeah. I know who did what. I know who the bad guys are. I know all that stuff. I know where I want to end up. I know all those things. Um, but I don't know how I quite get there. It's like, you know, if you're going to get in the car, I'm going to start driving from New York and I'm going to San Francisco. Well, I know I'm starting here and I'm going to go to there. But I have a hundred different routes I could take to get there. Yeah. And so I start off on this journey. Um, I can take sort of detours and here and there and think, oh, I could do this, I could do that. So the opportunities that exist in the book, uh, I don't realize until I get to them that I could that I can do this now. But I do know where I'm going. Before you have mm. uh, it's kind of I I learned that lesson really early because when I was writing that first Zach Walker book and I met, had an agent and I had two thirds of the book done. And my agent read the first two thirds and she said, and because I say she's really good at working out plots and stuff. And she said, who did it? Like, who's the killer? And I said, well, it's either, and she said, stop. She said, if you don't know, stop. And before you read another chapter, figure out the last third of this book. And I did. And and it was a really good lesson because then I figured it all out. Thought, oh, yeah. And then it all just, all, it, all the tumblers fell into place. That's so nice, yeah. I want to know who did it because when I'm jumping from one character's head to another as they speak, if this character is lying, I want to know that. Because when I jump into their head, I need to know their motivation. I need to know that they are, that they're lying, that they're spinning a tail. And so I need to know that. Um, but, you know, like for every writer that there is, there's a different approach. And oh, I know. But I think that's fascinating because that's that's exciting thing, isn't it? That the, the, the different approaches, but also for you as a writer, you're keeping it exciting if you're writing, if you're finding your way through it. Because if you if you know, I mean, some a lot of people say, well, if you overplot, then there's no joy in writing the book. Um, and I think that's I think that's an ideal. And you've, when you've got the confidence to do that, that's an ideal balance. You know, I mean, I've done... Uh, Ian Rankin's a friend. I've done lots of events with Ian over the years, and Ian talks about he doesn't he doesn't plan it all out. He starts working. He said he writes the book to find out what happened. Happened, yeah. Which I think is great and you know exciting, but I, I don't work that way. You know, I figure yeah. I wouldn't I wouldn't start building a house without blueprints. Yeah. I wouldn't build a house without some without building an, a, a solid foundation before the walls go up. And so I have it. I have to go out of a different. Yeah, no, that makes perfect sense. Um, I'd be exactly the same there. So, and then you, but when you start writing that first draft, you write it quite fast, don't you? How long does it take you to write the first draft? First draft is usually two and a half to three months. Um, I try to write 
about 2,000 words a day, that's 10,000 words in a week. And so in two and a half months, you've got a first draft, maybe three months. So that's generally how I work. And it's nice, I like to be able to, to choose a time to write when I know I won't have any interruptions. Like if I, if I knew I were going on a book tour, if any one of the, if any of those ever happen again. Yeah. Um, but if I thought, well, it's the first of September and I've got a book tour in October, I would not want to start writing a book in September because I'd like to be able to just work right have through the flow that. right the way through. Um, and I think a lot of this comes from, you know, as I said, I spent three decades in newspapers. So mm-hmm. writing is just is work. You yeah. know, you don't you don't you know, all this writer's block crap, you know, this sort of <laughs> Like who? Do you get plumber's block? I, I know. know. I was just gonna say plumber's block. <laughs> we're, we're writers are just so precious that we have a condition to describe just being too lazy to get our work done. And so, as you work in newspapers and you say, "Oh, the muse, the yeah. you, can't do <laughs> you can't do that, can you? You've got a deadline." <laughs> work. Um, so writing's a job. So I that's yeah, it's oh my, it's work. Yeah, that's no, fascinating. Two thousand words a day, and that's yeah, keeping going and, and keeping moving through it. And then when you finish that very first draft, you rewrite a good bit. And I read somewhere that you were saying that one book took longer to fix than it did to write the first draft. Uh, you know, uh, no time for goodbye was like lightning in a bottle. I mean, that first draft was was not very different from the final one. And yeah. books like The Accident and uh, Tap on the Window, I went through just massive rewrites on those books. They just didn't have it right the first time. But like, if, you know, if I finish a first draft in, in two and a half months, I'll put it aside for a week and then I'll go back and look, go through it and might take another week and on it. And then I'll give it to my editors. Yeah. Because um, I figure there's no sense killing myself doing a hundred other things to this until I find out whether they think everything's wrong anyway. So I'm just why I'm going to get it to them and see what they think. So, but I always find that I'm in that period right now where You've delivered a book. I've delivered next year's book, and it's with my. And it's like waiting for Tess to come back from the doctor. (laughs) (laughs) That that I am I going to be okay? Yeah, is it going to work? All all over. So um, that's always a bit of a a stressful time waiting for. Oh yeah, exciting too though. It's and it's lovely. I think that break them is is like you say. You put it away for a week before you go back to it, and that's really valuable too because you need new eyes, don't you? Because you get so absorbed in the story especially a complicated one like Find Your First. Um, you, I find that, it's interesting, I find that you get so close to it, you you not only can't see what's not working, you don't even see what is working, you know, because you might finish it, people go, people be, wow, I love the part about it, and think, oh, okay, I guess that was all right, you know, but it's, you get so close to it, you just, I mean, I have, I have some books that are favorites that I've done, and some, yeah. And someone will say, oh, my absolute favorite book is such and such a book, which is, might be my, what I like the least. And it seems, yeah. rude, seems rude to argue and say, no, I'm sorry, you're wrong. That's <laughs> a piece of shit. It's just awful. And and so I just say, OK, yeah, thanks. That's great. You know? That's good. That's good. I'll move on to the next one. So and so obviously you're working ahead. You've got the, ne- the next idea delivered. Um, have you have you an idea for the book? The next two, yeah. I mean, the next one. I have no. I need to start writing a book probably by the end of September, October. I have no idea what it would be at all, but that's okay because something will always come. But I actually, yeah. so the book that would be out, say, a year from now, I have delivered that manuscript, but I'm. I know it'll come back to me, and I'll have work to do on that. Yeah. And I wrote a book. God, it must be like two, three years ago now. I wrote another novel that was. A little bit different than when I. This used is your to do cars it. book, isn't it? So this is just the spare book. I'm really interested in the spare book. It's a, Go on. A Michael Crichton kind of a thriller, you know. Um, I call it Think Jurassic Park, but instead of dinosaurs, it's self-driving cars. Oh, got, I think it sounds brilliant. Yeah. Test community where every car on the road is a self-driving car, and then a virus gets introduced into the system, and all the cars become homicidal. It's great fun. <laughs> you love it. Yeah. So, so I wrote this. Everybody likes it, but they think. It's not really what you usually do. How are we going to market this? What are they, you know, like? And so, but we think we're going to bring it out uh, before the end of the year, maybe just as an ebook or maybe, I don't know. We're going to be, but I think that'll be out. I do think it'll be out before the end of this year. Excellent. That's good to hear because I remember when uh, when you were in Dublin last time, I think you were talking about that, the, the spare book. Um, and yeah. I was really interested in, like, and yeah, it was interesting to see where it would go and maybe do it under yeah. a different name or whatever. 
it's kind of like it's kind of like a thousand Christines, you know, all at once. <laughs> Brilliant. Brilliant. No, it's great. It sounds fantastic. Um and really interesting. And it's really interesting to go off in a different direction too. I mean, do you feel I mean thrillers are your thing now, but did that stretch you? Is it just was the idea just arrived and you plans of going that way? I have another idea for a sort of I don't know if it's sci-fi or or whatever, but it's but I have another idea that I've been I've had in back of my head for literally years that I maybe eventually will do one day. But it's again, it's a bit of a departure from what people expect to read from me. Yeah. So uh, it's figuring out when's the right time or well, you know that kind what of what to thing. do with it. Yeah. Perhaps you just need another name, and then you can just let them out. These that, all these slightly sci-fi ones. New new might, a whole new readership. That might be the answer. To bring them in now, oh, goodness me, this is fa absolutely fascinating. Um, we have had a host of questions, um, so I think this might be a good time to bring Mr. Truen in, who hope people have been keeping an eye on the questions. Um, I'm going to pop him and I'm going to pop in the book again. Uh, here he comes. Just give us a couple of seconds, then we can go through them because I can see loads there, Simon. I'm just going to bring the book in, Simon, so we've got a better layout. That's better, isn't it? There we go. Have we got, oh, we need to unmute you. Hang on a minute. You got. To, uh, I'm just going to unmute you. Try that now. So, now we can uh, yeah, you. I think you've been keeping an eye on them as well. But I think, uh, firstly, people don't want the hour ever to end. But I know you've <laughs> got fascinating. Uh, to do something uh, pretty quickly. Um, I, I've got a question before we go to these fantastic ones I've got here. You, you mentioned about the pandemic and you mentioned about how we've got to, uh, as writers, you've got to grab readers' attention. Um, do you think the whole notion of what a contemporary novel or contemporary thriller is going to be in the future is going to be changed by what we've all lived through? I don't know. I mean, it's, I mean, did World War II change what thrillers are? Did, you know, I mean, it's, this is a major event for sure. Um, but uh, if people keep asking, are we going to write a thriller about a pandemic? And I think, well, there's mm -hmm. probably only 700 other authors who yep. have debated novel about the pandemic and it's and and how much do, will we necessarily at least right away want to read about yeah through it it's like oh please i've had enough uh, i mean there's already somebody's made some movie that went straight to netflix it's about a pandemic i can't imagine wanting to watch this although i did watch contagion oh gosh that was i watched that early on bad idea but, but i think everyone should have been forced to watch actually but anyway oh, it was terrifying Think that so I don't plan to write it, but I do think, like the novel that I've just delivered, which I have set in the year that it comes out in 2022, there are a couple of references to yeah. it because we can't pretend it didn't happen. Like there's a reference to the guy who still got some sanitizer in his truck or some latex gloves that he used when he would go buy gas, and so it's it's like yeah that happened, and and I'm hopeful that by the time the book would come out in over a year that we'll kind of mostly move past this. Um, either that or we're all going to set our books from here on in 2019. Um, but then I think the great pandemic thriller was written by uh, Mr. King in around 1979. It was called The Stand. I mean, we can't yeah. top. So what would be the point? I mean, I think it, I, for me anyway, it's going to like, you know, if you're writing a novel and a couple of people meet in a bar, are they going to meet in a bar? Are they going to, are they going to sit close together? Are yeah. they going to shake hands? Will our habits change moving forward so we don't do these things? I, I think that remains to be seen. So um, I guess all these people who write historical novels, they don't have to worry about this. No, that's for sure. <laughs> um, when you, uh, a lot of people we've spoken to talk about how if you want to be a writer, you've got to be a reader first and foremost. And I think you've talked a lot about reading and writing when you were growing up. Do you... Um, do you read other authors while you're writing or do you kind of shut off your uh, influences? I hear that from some people that they, you know, that when they're writing, they can't read. I think, well, can you not walk and chew gum? I mean, it's, it's, it's I mean, if I didn't, I write a book a year and, yep. and, and, and between writing it and editing it and all stuff, that takes up like five, six months out of the year. Mm -hmm. I think, so if I chose not to read stuff at that time, there wouldn't be a lot, I wouldn't get a lot of reading done. So it's not an issue for me. Like I'll read whatever I want when I'm working. It's not, it's, it's totally separate. And do you read widely in lots of genres like, like anyone else? Yeah, I, I, I mean, I do read a lot of, I do read a lot of crime fiction. Uh, I don't know if I read a lot of thrillers, like, like the kind of thing I write. Um, 
but uh, I'm kind of all over the place to some degree. Um, I mean, I just read Barack Obama's book a few weeks ago, uh, read two novels that were this massive novel called Paradise Falls that was written back in the 60s that I've been waiting to read forever and I had time in January. And occasionally I read a biography or something. Um, but I tend to read when it, when it comes to crime fiction and so forth. I read uh, people who I think are way better than I am. And I just look and think, wow, how can I get to be good? You know, like you read, you pick up James Lee Burke and you think, how does he do this? You know, how does he write one of these mm. every It's just astonishing piece of work. So, but I do kind of read, you know, all sorts of different things. Yeah, it's, it's really interesting. Somebody's saying here that they've they read um, Elevator Pitch and um, it was so good. They were really, just, they didn't know what to go to next. They couldn't find anything after it. So the only problem was it was too hard to find a book that was satisfied after that, and her daughter was the same. So, yeah, I think you're 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 meet, meeting the mark for sure. She'll and you'll love Find Your First too as well. So, um, but I yeah, I'm reading this, thinking the same thing, reading people who are the experts, definitely. Well, you know, I, like I, I'll read, like I said, read James E. Burke or whatever, and I and I'll and I'll read certain people, and I think, boy, am I ever glad you don't? We don't all have to be this good to get published. <laughs> <laughs> Just hand in any old thing to get published. Others are just really, you know, cranking out beautifully. Just uh, and you know, I'm looking forward to. I just reread. I'm speaking of, you know, like I was talking about the car book. I just yeah. I reread Stephen King's Christine, which I read, I think in 1984. I hadn't read it since, and I just thought I'm gonna pick this up again. And so I've, I've done that. I've gone back to a few things that I'd read a long time ago through the pandemic that I just thought I'm gonna go back to this and see. See what I think of it now, and it was, of course, it was still great. Have you? Uh, do you ever reread any of your earlier books? Oh God, no! Uh, <laughs> no, I don't. I don't. No, I never reread any of my own books. I just uh, it would be just too painful. It'd be like looking at baby pictures or something, or you know those high school yearbook photos. Um, I just uh, and, and the other thing is, of course, you read and you think, wow, I can I can totally see where this is going. Um, so no, I don't read, I do not read my own books ever. That's fascinating. I find that that's the thing, isn't it? When you go back over it, that's the thing that always worries me when you're reading your own book, um, after that first or second draft stage is that, you know, what happens at the end and it's very hard to tell whether or not you've hidden it well enough. Do you, do you have problems with that or do you, or do you, you're saying that you're thinking in terms of the motivation of the characters every time you write a chapter and are they lying or what are they doing? Um, do you find it hard to hide the ending or is that something that just now at this stage of experience gets hidden nicely along the way? I, I'm sorry, I didn't quite follow. Hide, so, find it so, hard. so, you know, when you know what the end is and you're working yeah. towards it, when you're reading back over, I always find it difficult when you're reading back over it because you know what the end is. You can't tell whether you've hidden it well enough. Well, that's a good question, whether you've, you know, because you want to sort of play fair with the reader so that, if they were really paying attention, they might see what was yeah. coming, but it's this sort of sleight of hand thing, you know, like a card trick. It's all happening in front of you, but you didn't see it. So I do like to try to do that. And sometimes it would be a really good editor will, when they go through it, will say, I think this line or this part here gives too much away. That that find a way to just sort of just hide this. You can leave it there, but we just sort of tuck it under something or whatever. And and so sometimes that can happen. That or else you will, like the book that I have just finished that I've handed, and I'm worried that this one particular character, maybe this, it's too obvious. And I gave it to a friend to read, and he didn't see it, see it coming. But I may have an editor who will. And so when I get back to it, I'll have to find a way to shade that character, do something so that it's not quite so obvious. Yeah, I and mean, that's the thing is that sleight of hand, I think you've nailed, really nailed it there in terms of how you move through the story it, it, it literally is sleight of hand to try yeah, and keep it moving like, something that's happening here is really important and is the key to the whole thing but we're going to give you a little dazzling bright object over here and you won't notice it you know but it was there yeah no brilliant oh we've lost simon again simon you're on mute i don't know what's happened to your sound just see if you can press your buttons there no we lost you might need to pop out and come back in again. No, you've gone. It's all right. Don't worry. If you want to, do you want to pop out, 
just let's try again. Nope, lost you. Do you want to come back out, go out and come back in again? The joys of technology. There we go. You'll be back in a second. Um, yeah, I think that that's the thing, is it's that shiny object and it's finding the shiny object to distract the reader. Um, and that's the thing actually that happens in Find You First is because the because these things are woven in so tightly um, that we're always looking over here and yet there's this stuff happening over here. Um, sometimes I will do is I will weave in what looks like a subtle clue and it's and it's just unsubtle enough that a reader will go, oh, I know what's going on here. That's that's who did it. But it's a red herring. Like it's. <laughs> But it's it's not. But it's it's been introduced in a subtle way so that you'll think that you know something, but yeah. you don't. You don't because you then you're taken. And then that's the thing. Because I mean, I would say you're the absolute king of twists because those. But all the all of your books have twists. Do you know the twists before you start? I mean, you were talking about knowing the end and, and finding yeah. your way through. Big twists, I do, and then sometimes I think too. Some twists are not necessarily big twists, but they are. Excuse me, just they're they're in the way you present them um and I, sometimes as we talked i talked earlier about ending on a, like chapters like yeah. commercial if you present something that's just a little bit of a twist at the end of a chapter because it's the end of a chapter it feels like a bigger twist yeah and it may not be that big but it's just enough of one and so but anytime you have any to me anytime there's any kind of a twist it has to be at the end of a chapter and some of them are little and some of them are are big like there's one i think huge one in find you first and that that so far everyone i've talked to not anyone has seen coming and uh and so those are the big ones and you can't know that's a writer you, you know it's you know you're going to do it you know it's coming and you kind of can't wait to get to it get that oh that's so so exciting such a good book Simon, have we got you back again yeah so i was just going to say I, I really enjoyed that uh, hearing that insecurity from you about the fact that you've um, given your book in and you're waiting to see whether what your editor thinks about it. Does it always feel like that with every book? Does wish the last part in here? Yeah, your sounds a bit strange. You're just saying that the does it you have that insecurity when you hand in a hand in a book every time that you um, you oh, have yeah. that nervousness to know what's going to happen. Oh yeah, I mean, 20, bo 20 books in, I still feel like, oh God, I hope I haven't completely screwed it up this time. And I find that, so I do feel a little anxious with every book still. And and every book I have done has gotten better with, with working with a really good editor. And, and so I don't always agree with everything that they suggest, but a lot of times they see things that really can improve a book. But it is it is kind of uh, that waiting period can be difficult. But and a lot of times, you know, I'll make a I'll I'll make a kind of fundamental error in a book, and I think, okay, I'm going to learn from that one. I won't make that mistake again, and I don't. And then in the next book, I make a whole new one. Because <laughs> it's a learning process, isn't it? All the way through. It's always a learning process. I don't think that you know. I and I think maybe that's why a lot of us keep writing book after book is we're still trying to write that absolutely perfect book and it's just so elusive you know to write that one that's just perfect from beginning to end you know and it hasn't happened yet oh uh, well i think well i think find your first is is awesome and uh is very close to being a perfect book um it's really i mean it's brilliant i'm hoping all the guys are going to be buying it um you might have lost simon now because of the sound situation um but thank you so much for joining us um oh. i'm going to I'm going to bump this. I'm just going to take the cover away. We've got it there, but I can see, so I can see you a little bit better. Um, all the way from Canada, um, and you're doing a few more. You another event later this morning, have you? Because actually, it's seven a.m. Just to let everybody know that this is dedication to the cause now. I got another one in an hour, so I can go down now and finish breakfast. Absolutely. And if, if you were to look at this 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 screen an hour ago, it would have been a lot darker. But we now have some light coming in. Sunlight. So your day has started. Well, but thank you. Larry from this artificial light. Yeah, no, it's brilliant. Listen, thank you so much for joining us and starting off your day with us. It, um, it has been fascinating with some amazing nuggets of wisdom in there. I mean, just really just brilliant. Um, so I'm hoping that we've sent the links out into the, into the comments. People can buy the book. It'll be up on YouTube as well. Um, and obviously we'll be sharing it. So we wish, oh, the other thing, you probably already know this, but it's number two in the um, Irish uh, fiction chart, original thank fiction chart. Ireland, thank you so much. We're Which is pretty impressive. I, Very yeah. good. Great. Thank you so much. I it's awesome. It.
So on that note, thank you very much indeed, Mr. Linwood Barclay. I hope to see you very soon, hopefully in Dublin again soon. Hope so. And uh, enjoy your breakfast. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs>